here, so hopefully, bear with me, I'll be drinking my apple juice here and talking as loud as I can. Uh, so can everyone hear me in the back? Yeah. Excellent, awesome. Okay. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I think people can probably, there's room up here if people just want to yeah, fill up. in and fill in this, yeah, these two front corners. There's room like, here. People can sit up here. Yeah, so, if, yeah, if there are people like waiting outside, I think people just keep coming in and probably have a little space up front. Just stand over here, walk up here. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Cool. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, again, sorry if you're here with me with my voice. Um, so this session is about 20 minutes. We'll likely spend a few minutes going over it to show a quick demo. Um, but first, we want to get the content out of the way. So just FYI. Um, so this is the Road to E2 Phase 2 and Phase 2 testnet. Um, this, in general, this talk and a lot of the work on Phase 2 has mainly been a collaboration between two teams. Um, so Quilts uh, and we're a team um, that has formed under R&D within Consensus and then the EWASM team uh, at the EF. And so um, we have been uh, working on a lot of things in collaboration here and over the coming few days here at DevCon, uh, we have multiple sessions that we're working together on. So we'll kind of give an overview on that. Um, for this talk, I'm going to breeze through a lot of things. I don't expect everyone to necessarily follow every piece, but I, I want to kind of just uh, bring some of these ideas to the forefront of a lot of people's minds. Um, and then I think over the coming months, as content comes out and more things come out, a lot of this will probably hit, click a little bit better. So, um, okay, goal of talk, I want to bring everyone up to date on phase two, where phase two is at right now. Um, set some of the terminology, find the current space, and then share progress in a quick demo. Um, so I'm just gonna, for those of you, just to catch you up real quick, um, phase zero, uh, so basically E2 is split up into two main phases for launch, three main phases. Uh, there's phase zero, uh, which is the beacon chain, which you can basically summarize as managing a lot of the overhead logic of the system, being an organizing layer, manages finalities of the shards, it lets shards check themselves in via crosslink so they can communicate with each other, and you can trust that the shard will never ever change. It reaches a point of finality. So this is kind of the beacon chain. It also manages those who are staking their funds and becoming validated as well. It manages their duties. Uh, phase one is where we have the shards that come into play, and here we really bring the shards to a point of stability. Um, and make sure that everything that's working and as far as shuffling these committees together can actually bring this thing to, to a degree of stability. Um, in phase one, we'll allow for data uploads, so there's ways that ETH1 can interface with, um, with ETH2 just when phase one is launched by itself. Uh, phase two, this is what I say, uh, kind of brings the shards to life. Um, so this is where we have state execution, this is where we begin talking about things like smart contracts, uh, transactions across shards, um, pieces like that. So this kind of brings the system to life, and this is where you get the real utility out of E2. Um, so I'm going to give like a real quick summary of some things under E1, and hopefully we can draw that and connect that to E2, so you guys have a general understanding of the space behind E2. Um, so in E1, um, you can kind of consider there to be one execution environment that's enshrined in E1. Um, so basically, there's a hard-coded transaction execution framework within E1. Uh, if you need to change it, you need a fork. So as an example, a transaction ETH1 has nonce gas price, gas limit, two value data. Uh, we do RLP encoding, um, and then we apply a signature. Uh, if we want to add a field, or we want to remove a field, or change a field, it's going to require a fork, right? Um, also in ETH1, we have this global state, right? This global state that includes um, everyone's accounts, and in their accounts, you have these fields, nonce balance, storage, root code hash, that is organized um, into what we call a um, Patricia Merkle tree. Um, so if we want to change that accumulator, that data structure, if we want to add fields to the count structure, if we want to remove fields, then we're going to have to have a fork on the system. Um, so again, what we're saying here is that we have everything kind of enshrined and hard-coded into E1. So E2 kind of follows this radical shift, um, and it's where we realize that the core consensus layer 
um, doesn't necessarily need an opinion on that transaction structure, doesn't necessarily need an opinion on what the global state looks like. And in fact, um, the core consensus layer is really good at ordering pieces, it's really good at managing um, some of the, the parts behind validators, slashings, rewards, fork choice rules, um, and defining the tooling. For example, in ETH2, we have eWASM as, as the main set of tooling by which execution happens under. So it's really good at that. And so in ETH2, we take kind of this radical shift, though, and we say we don't need an opinion on what a transaction necessarily looks like. We don't need an opinion on um, how the state um, is affected. These things can be minimalistic, and we can write these ourselves. And so this is kind of a goofy uh, diagram, but I think it can be like really interesting and very illustrative. Um, so within ETH2 on a single shard, um, you could have multiple different basically frameworks that are running. So um, we could have ETH1 running on one shard, we could have a UTXO model, a Bitcoin-like model running on a shard, we could have a roll-ups um, system on a shard, we could have an ETH2 account model. Say we want to learn from ETH1, use new accumulators, make things a little bit more efficient have better structures, we can build a new model that's geared towards ETH2 and WASM centric. Um, we could have something like Zexy. We could run Libra on ETH2. And so this is, this is really cool. You can set um, the semantics behind these execution environments to basically operate um, different frameworks. And so some people might kind of think of it as, you know, maybe an interesting analogy is you can kind of create this execution space or execution environment um, that might be akin to basically provisioning different VMs that, that set the semantics of what can occur. Um, one thing to keep in mind, for example, within this galaxy of ETH1, all these contracts can communicate with each other synchronously. Um, same with in the account model and all these different pieces. Um, once you start communicating across these various pieces, um, likely there would be asynchronous communication involved. Um, so diving deeper, what does this look like? Uh, the beacon chain stores a set of peer reducing functions, which gives the rules by which transactions will run within an execution environment. It bounds the state and transitions to a particular rule. Um, so uh, I'll kind of show you this. So in ETH1, you could consider there being a regular function here. A uh, block includes a bunch of transactions. So our uh, data um, or our argument that we pass into the function is this transaction list. It begins with a state. We get, a new, we get a new state as prime. Um, if we go into a stateless model, which I'll talk about in a moment, I'll breathe through. Uh, breathe through, you can call this a pure function because we're putting in a pre-state root uh, hash and getting a post-state root hash directly. So what, what we have in basically ETH2 and within phase two, we have this system where we can pull down these WASM basically bounding contracts that set the, set the rules of how you affect state and how transactions are coming in, what the transaction looks like, how it's validated, um, and then you can go ahead and uh, bind each of these different models to, uh, to, those, uh, to that WASM script. So we could have ETH1, a UTXO model, another account model that's running um, on ETH2, and these can all go in tandem and they have the same peer reducing function. Um, so right now we have Scout. So Scout is um, something that was um, originally pushed forward by, by Alex and, and the EWAS team. It's a prototyping engine um, where we can already begin building execution environments, these different execution environments that run on uh, ETH2. And uh, we have a link here. Um, basically, all it comes down to is what you saw in the diagram. There's a process block function with a pre-state group. It takes block data as an argument, and we get a post-state group or post-state um, view into it. Um, so a couple things, execution environments are not necessarily analogous to smart contracts. Um, they define an execution environment where smart contracts can run. Um, basically, they can define WASM spawning other WASM. Um, and uh, I actually really like a quote from Robert Drost. With EEs, ETH2 abstracts the fixed execution semantics of almost any conceivable programmable blockchain in a similar way to how ETH1 abstracted the fixed semantics of digital tokens currency in the early blockchain Bitcoin era. So this is really powerful. We can run a lot of systems on ETH2. Um, so EWASM, uh, state execution happens within the consensus of each shard. Everything is EWASM. EWASM gives you tooling. It gives you a constant gas limit, metering, um, host runtime functions that can be called. So you can pass the beacon state, the shard state into your functions. You can access a lot of these uh, core utilities that you um, on a shard, the state would likely have a list of hashes, and those are the pre-hashes of all these execution environments that follow this reducing function. So you know what the last state was. 
Um, so everything's stateless, um, and so this this means that Presswick gave kind of a talk on this earlier. This means that um, we do need some type of uh, incentive mechanism in the system called state providers. We might need relayers. We may not. There are a lot of different uh, proposals that are in place right now. Um, and so, but the stateless paradigm is interesting. I'm just going to break it down as quick as possible. All it is is that when you include a transaction, you basically include the database with your transaction. So. If Will Villanueva is uh, transferring five shard to or five ETH to Alex as an example, with my transaction, I need to show a proof that my account looks the way it does, and that Alex's account looks the way it does. I have to show that I have five ETH. He has to show that uh, we have to show that he has maybe two ETH in his account, and then we can make the update and we can update the state there. So basically, the stateless system you can consider each transaction comes with a database built in that rolls into a Merkle group that has this official proof. Um, I won't go into refreshes. Um, but every execution environment can set up their own um, their own accumulators, own different pieces. So merging proofs, this is if you have a bunch of transactions together that all have their own proofs, or what I said is, you know, the analogy is a database with your transaction. Um, you can kind of merge these together, Bob giving funds to Jill, Ted giving funds to Mel, you have one proof, you can just read from that, and now we can touch all these accounts. Uh, again, this is a really high level overview, but hopefully it helps in, in some way. There's a switch over that happens. So um, once ETH2 runs, we're gonna bring ETH1, and we're gonna start running ETH1 under ETH2. So um, we call this the switch over. Um, there's work right now happening on building an ETH1 execution environment that then will go ahead and run on one of the shards in uh, under ETH2. Um, Part of that, one of the big pieces, we need to build the EVM in WASM, um, which there is already some work going on around that. Um, and we want to expand ETH1 to have more functionality, um, to be aware of shards, um, cross-shard transactions, account mm -hmm. extraction, a lot of work here to do. ETH2EE, the general definition of this is um, we want ETH2 to be compatible uh, with ETH1 running on it and running within a shard and being able to expand across multiple shards. But there's a lot of things we've learned since then, uh, better accumulator formats, better better ways to structure things. Um, we also want to create a more WASM-centric system. Um, and so this is called, we may be migrating towards this concept of an ETH2 EE, which is an iterated or um, improved version on some of the constructs that we have with ETH1. Uh, Cross-shard transactions, again, I'm going to kind of breeze through this. Um, there's basically gets run into a few different models. Um, we have asynchronous, which we rely on the core protocol. This is what it provides at the layer one level. We have fast asynchronous. These are somewhat complex systems where we optimistically make decisions. And then we can have some synchronous systems as well. This falls into delayed state execution. Um, you could do even some form of roll-ups, optimistic roll-ups, um, hybrid layer one and two approaches. For what the core protocol provides, um, uh, if you're doing asynchronous, let's just talk about this as an example. HLLs and DSLs, HLL is Solidity, high level programming languages, Viper um, should provide proper tooling. This means that imagine um, basically cross shard calls are akin to uh, the concept of programming with the concept of threads. So this means that um, in essence, uh, that tooling should be there um, for developers, and as a developer is writing a smart contract, they're going to have to be more aware of asynchronous systems, um, message-driven approaches. Uh, one one thing that people have talked about is an actor model, two-phase commit schemas, locking, read, write. These are all constructs you find across threads, and this is kind of how it gets abstracted into the system. Uh, latency for these models are reduced to the time to finality. So depending on there are some you know other. Depending on the proposals that come, but that that is um, that is the limitation. Uh, other changes in DevX. So DAPs um, will likely be faster due to POS and sharding. Um, Web three uh, Ethers JS the interface. If you're dealing with ETH one, shouldn't actually change that much under the hood. It changes significantly. Uh, but those libraries need to be updated to deal with some of the new execution environments, like the ETH2 execution environment. We need more WASM-centric smart contract languages. This is also how it's going to affect the general DevX. Should I build an EE? So one question is, are you a protocol researcher or developer? Um, do you have an idea which only makes sense as an EE, some type of flexibility you need that's outside of what exists 
in these core contract frameworks. Um, and uh, I would say, but if you don't learn about this, you may be left behind. And if you don't learn to leverage the new infrastructure to your advantage. So um, this will, there will be a new kind of tier of developer which thinks of EE, which is more of a protocol flexibility enhanced layer, and smart contract developers um, as well. So um, we've been working quite specifically and also in tandem with uh, EWASM too, we've been working on a simulator for phase one too. So we already have this working. We're able to simulate multiple shards and communication with the beacon chain. Um, it's a command line tool, and what we're building is not production focused. Um, so it builds local validators and keys. It's not a networked testnet. Um, it simulates forks, it simulates reorgs. Um, the main goal of this is that it's a test ground for running EEs and simulating cross shard behavior. So with the simulator, what the, the goal is, is that we can already do research and build these EEs, mimic cross shard behavior, mimic forks, mimic reorgs, and with that, we can already, um, we can already have some development uh, moving forward in what we would have within the actual phase two um, development time when it shows. Um, uh, Sheath is, I mentioned this, this is another tool um, that uh, Matt, Matt built, which is kind of an early construct of what a state provider relearn might be. It keeps the state locally, um, and it communicates with block producers. Um, it builds these multi-proofs and witnesses that you need in a stateless system, and it's also tooling for doing the transfers of the token. So we kind of already have an early, early piece of that. Um, so there's a bunch of EEs um, that uh, EWASM team uh, and Quilt has been involved with in benchmarks. I'm going to let like Alex talk a little bit as well, and then we're going to also show some of the upcoming talks. So yeah, can you guys hear me? Is it loud enough? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So which this one? Yeah. Yeah. So my name is Alex. I'm part of the EWASM team, and this is the things we have been mostly doing in the past couple of months. With the exception of Sheet, that's done, of course, by men. Um, so we have multiple motivations for doing these things. One, we wanted to prove that this can be done uh, in that challenging time frame we have. So that means there's a time we can spend on chain uh, on a given block. Um, so that was motivation one. And motivation two is to give you guys the best practices how to write EEs, uh, how to write optimized EEs, etc. Um, so there is a big distinction between the two there. Uh, the first to the SMP and the Turbo token, they're kind of like compatible with the E1 uh, tree structure, but the false and cheat are not. Um, so the first two, I mean, SMP is not really useful, but it's like a good baseline. Turbo token might be something which could be used with this E1 switchover, um, and cheat and false might be used for a pure E2 dedicated uh, EE. Um, we have a bunch of other things. Um, however, I really want you guys to keep an eye on these sessions um, in the coming days. So tomorrow we have um, an hour and a half long session, um, the EWASM past, present, future. We're going to have a long talk about benchmarking, where we're going to show all these numbers, uh, all the results we have uh, with the EEs. Um, and that's a really good starting point um, to come to day three for the 2.0 talk. Now, that's a two hour long session, but don't be afraid. It's, it has a ton of small talks. Um, and we're going to explain all these EEs one by one. Um, but before that, we're going to have a long intro, a long version of what uh, Will has done today. Um, we're also going to have a couple of um, minutes for Q&A between those sessions. But the big place to ask questions is the AMA on the last day. That's a 90-minute session to only have questions and nothing else. Um, and tomorrow also, there's this developer experience, which probably is really useful to you guys. Uh, because that's purely focused on uh, questions regarding the developer experience. I'm not sure that you're going to do the demo now. Yeah, yeah, so right. I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah. So, uh, real quick, so we'll do a demo. Matt's going to like run it, and I'll, I'll give an overview. Um, <coughs> a couple things in the DevX will kind of give a similar talk to what I just gave um, that session. Um, and then uh, also in this uh, EWASM 2.0 session, we're going to give a very in-depth version of this demo and explain what we're building and what it is in the long term. So come to that and we'll like show some code and actually um, express that. Um, but I guess what we just want to show um, at this point is, yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, at this point is that, um, yeah. So what we want to show at this point is that we have these like systems running real quick. This will just be like a minute. So what we do with the simulation, in this case, we're fast forwarding the beacon chain. 
um, to move to uh, the uh, phase one fork epic. Um, so this is occurring. See the lighthouse guys loving the logs. High <laughs> 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 five, right? Here. Um, so now we have uh, shard chain zero running um, that's operating. So uh, we actually have an execution environment running on the shard chain right now. Um, and it's completely stateless, so we are managing state via this tool or this binary, um, which is akin to what a state provider may have in the long term, so we already have progress on this. Um, and also the goal is that we can run um, all the EEs that we just talked about, Alex shared, uh, within the simulation as well, and we can continue to expand and show uh, cross shard behavior. So in this case, um, we can set up a transfer, a proof is set up locally, you have a local version of the state, you send it to a block producer, um, so we have endpoints to interact with the block producers and to interact with the um, system as a whole. Um, and a new e-root e is set up and then you can look at the tool, check the balance. Um, and this is really cool. Um, we have this running and so um, we're pretty close from already um, doing basic operation of smart contracts. Um, so we already have kind of a, um, a prototype, Matt actually built this, it's really cool, um, that has, um, that's able to continuously spawn and continue to watch them. And so um, I think, you know, before the new year, around the new year, we'll already, you know, have some basic contracts running on this. This will be expanded. There's a lot of cleanup. I want to make this a, a clean and, and friendly tool um, that's very configurable um, and is running 16 shards at once, and then people can begin doing this. I would say general timeline to get it to a really clean state um, we're looking at uh, some time by the end of this year or in January, um, and uh, hopefully by that point we can have some base. We'll have some basic contracts that are running. Um, if you guys have any questions, let me know. Uh, follow me during the conference. Um, most of all, uh, attend those sessions. Um, yeah, there's going to be a lot to show, so um, we're excited. Thanks, guys.